Namaste. Uh, so I usually get some kind of inspiration of what I would like to talk about for this time or what I would like to focus on at some point before the session. And tonight there's just nothing at all coming. So um, we'll see what happens with this time. Uh, so I thought we could just throw it open. Um, if anyone has any questions or anything they'd love to share, any breakthroughs they've made, if you'd like to know more about anything specific around um, any part of awakening or anything about my journey or anything at all really that you would want to discuss, I'd love to have a dialogue with you and uh, see where we can go. It's always so wonderful uh, to see where we can go with these questions and answers and how everyone learns from them is just beautiful, isn't it? Um, we'll see, see what happens in this time. I've got no idea what's going to happen. Okay, well, Kelly, when you're ready. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Um, I wanted to ask you what it's like. Um, you touched on it a bit on the, one of your last sang sanghas of the um, the everywhereness for everybodyness um, and partly um, the first time I was ever able to understand maybe what you were talking about is when you said um, that you were forgetting about others <laughs> and phenomena. So I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah. Um, it's something that's very uh, misunderstood in general, isn't it? I think in awakening. Um, and what does it mean to be everywhere? How do we come to realize that? Is that kind of what you're, you're wanting me to uh, explain? Yes. Or? Yeah. Um, for, for me, there was a real uh, sense of feeling separate. I didn't feel like I was everywhere. If I am the infinite being, if, if everyone and everything is the infinite being, then there's only one of us here and that infinite being is experiencing itself in all these different uh, incarnations as a human being and... Um, other things also and it really became clear to me that uh, the more I thought about someone or something the more they seemed separate to me outside of me have you noticed that yourself wow yes yeah. um, and as I, as I recognized that clearer I began to realize that if I focused on the essence of what that being is which is obviously the same as my essence, we, we can know that theoretically, even if, if not experientially, there must only be one of us if, if there's only an infinite being. So as I focus on the essence of, of something or someone, what it's made out of, then uh, I lose that sense of separation from them. And if I think about them um, and remember them and anticipate future meetings with that person or whatever um, then I feel very very separate to them so it was really a fundamental shift in how I was uh, perceiving other beings that they would always feel outside of me separate to me um, and other things as well like uh, money time you know things that I wanted and felt that I needed in my life uh, so as we learn to focus on the essence more, we begin to lose that sense of separation, which naturally reveals um, that there isn't really any boundary between me and everything else like we might have imagined. Have you been able to experience that at all? I'm sorry, somebody was calling and I got um, 
distracted trying to turn the phone off. I'm sorry. What did you ask me? Have you been able to kind of experience the difference between um, thinking about something and someone and how you feel very separate when you do that or when you focus upon the essence, your, either your essence or their essence, you begin to lose that sense of separation. The, the, the calm, um, that we're not necessarily going to have a feeling of being connected with everything, although that may happen as an experience, but the less my mind is thinking about other beings, uh, the more I have realized that there aren't any other beings in actuality, the more that thinking falls away. That resonated with me when I heard you say that earlier. It, it's, um, I wasted a lot of time trying to have a feeling of oneness, you know, with, I should feel one with everything or something like that. But then I realized, um, that that would still be two things, an intimacy with two things, me and this other being that I feel intimate with, or all beings. Can you can you see the division in that still? Ah. The separate? Yeah. And uh, the the realized kind of state, it, it was really uh, mind goes quiet because you really come to see there isn't really anyone outside of me, or separate to me. Although it will always seem that way if I focus on my thoughts, emotions and experiences only. It's sort of a self-sustaining illusion, isn't it? If I think, reference my thoughts here about someone over there, they're going to seem separate to me. And, and it's only really through focusing on the essence of that being or, or myself, the silence, the stillness, the awareness uh, that is common for all beings that that sense of separation begins to diminish you know that we're not reacting and responding to these other beings that we think are there ah. yes i think so, i was i thought i think i was feeling that way uh, months ago uh, a couple months ago and i thought that meant that i didn't care because i didn't have as much emotion about so it? it's a changeover at first because you might just feel a little, you're not sort of walking around in this reactionary state all the time, um, like we are as a separate being. But while that's shifting over, you might not feel the fullness of the peace and uh, joy and love and, you know, all the stereotypical things uh, that we associate with awakening. So you might feel in a little bit of a halfway at first, just kind of, Mind's a bit quieter than usual, uh, or, or there's periods where it just stops altogether. And um, even when it's talking, it's not quite as relevant as what it's saying. You know, it's not it's not quite as we don't have to listen to it so much. We're getting a little distance from it. Yeah, I'm not triggered by any thoughts. Associations. Yeah. It's different to what we think oneness is. Um, we can have an experience of oneness where I feel deeply connected to you or I recognize you are the same as me. But there's still in duality. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with duality, but you know, we've come here to kind of transcend that. Um, because if I have an experience of feeling connected with you, I'm going to also have to experience the other side of that duality, which is feeling very disconnected from you, very separate to you. So kind of going beyond both of those is the essence of um, oneness, you know, that there's, uh, there's nothing to think about in the end. There's nobody to think about. It's a different way to, to live, but it's... Um, very, very peaceful when you kind of begin to, to recognize that way. Can you feel it deepening in, um, a sense of that deepening? Yes. Good. It just gets clearer and clearer. For me, it was just more and more obvious as I went through, um, sort of sorting through these beliefs that 
if I reference thoughts and phenomena and emotions, I'm always going to feel separate. If I reference them only as, as a way to move through my world, I'm going to feel separate to everything and everyone. And there's no way out of that because I'm looking at my thoughts here only and I feel therefore I'm only here. It seems to re-emphasize that sense that I'm just in this one corner of the universe and everything else is uh, separate to me. And you really start to kind of get that, that the more we focus on the essence of something, the source of thoughts, uh, the, the ground of being, then we begin to just naturally lose that sense of separateness. It's, uh, it takes a lot of effort to sustain that sense of being separate to everything, although we don't always realize at first how much energy that costs us. Yes. Does that help you? Yeah. All right. good. Lovely. Good, good. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Would anyone else like to uh, share anything or ask anything? Andrew, when you're ready. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? I'm okay. Um, had an experience the other day while speaking with someone of just being absolute nothingness. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of anger came up from the ego. I like, wasn't enjoying seeing that, you know, just um, it kind of dissipated afterwards, but it was like, because there was nothing for ego there, it was just this absolute nothingness. It was like a little bit of irritation or something that came up. And It's quite normal, isn't it, that the, yeah. you sort of experience the natural state even momentarily. Um, something inside our ego panics a little bit and tries to drum up some action, you know, something to to make a meal out of. Or, mm. you know, some resistance will come to the surface as well in that openness sometimes. Mm. It's, um, it, hopefully you could sense, though, that you can experience it differently as that nothingness, that it's just some emotion arising, some sense of uh, irritation, or uh, that it, it's not impacting you the same from there, is it? There's a difference mm. to it. Yeah, it was almost just feeling it kind of dissipate on its own, like it was just a little energetic thing that needed to be dissolved and yeah. it's kind of resolving itself. Yeah, and then we done. Sorry, go sorry, ahead. I was, just, I was just curious if that's kind of how you're always experiencing now, is it like, because it was almost like there was no sense of a body there at all, it was just like nothingness. Is that how you experience all the time now? Yeah, things things come up in that nothingness every now and again to mm. to dissolve like that because they can in that openness as a separate being. We always feel that this emotion is happening to me. I'm irritated, or I'm angry, or I'm scared, and and that um, going into relationship with it when it comes up, it means it can't really dissolve, or it can it can mm. dissolve but really slowly. And mm. you can, you'll find that things come up sometimes quite intensely in that emptiness because uh, there's no resistance there is that you can't you can't push it away mm. or cling on to it or anything which is a good thing um some time to time things will come up even for me now every now and again i think yesterday i was getting irritated with the computer and <laughs> just, just laughing but it's just happening inside it's just happening inside you rather than to you. And it's yeah. really different then. And there's a sense that this needs to happen to release. It's been trapped inside somewhere, hasn't it? Mm. And you feel lighter, hopefully after it's gone, something yeah. shifted, moved. It was kind of a, an emptiness um, afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And all of these frequencies that we've created, all these vibrations, um, believing certain thoughts as a separate being, they will come uh, back to, they, they want to go back into this 
nothingness too. They want uh, they want in on the party, you know. So they'll come to um, dissipate and and uh, transmute themselves mm. in that openness. Normally, they try. They keep coming up our entire life, but we resist them. Uh, we don't want to feel it. So um, you might notice for a while that a lot of things come up, right. just to just to come back. If every thing that comes up that you don't resist, it turns back into peace. This mm. is why the peace increases. It comes back into a higher frequency. Like uh, I can't remember who described it, but somebody said that. Um, it's like all the emotions are on their journey to awakening too. They want yeah. enlightenment too, you know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on then, everybody, jump on. <laughs> yeah. It, it it was a bit fast and furious for me at first when I first sort of really uh, experienced that emptiness consciously. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of fear came up to an anger, a lot of anger uh, that could finally uh, be resolved. Yeah. And um, it went on for a while, but it, it's, you're not looking for it to finish because you're not suffering it like a separate being, no. as you, you know, it's different, isn't it? That's very true, yeah. So you might, you might just have some friends come to play for a while. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. It's very, very normal. It's very normal. Yeah. Good, good. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Helen. Okay, uh, Steve. Hello, Helen. Hi, yeah. How you doing? Not so bad. How are you? I'm good. Good. <clears throat> it's it's not what people people have been talking about a bit somehow or something else or not. Okay. Um, I think it's about the actor and the character. The question: Dare I be? When you say sometimes plant your flag, just live from there. Mm -hmm. Day, day, do it, you know, and I won't never quite grasp what that means. But if I have, I think. But if I let the character run free, I might, I might go mad, you know, I might start upsetting everybody and shouting and bawling. Um, So there's always like, somebody trying to moderate his behaviour. Something trying to control every moment, isn't there? Something manipulating subtly. Yeah. So do I just let it go? Just let it do it once? Without thought? If you can, just relax for a moment and just let yourself be exactly as you are in this moment, right? However that is, if you're irritated, be irritated. If you're peaceful, be peaceful. And just, you know, you can try it bit by bit, just letting go of uh, trying to control in that way. Because we have this idea from somewhere that by trying to control everything about ourselves, that's the way to get what we want and to feel how we want to feel. And then if I don't do it, as you said so well, some some sense, if I don't do it, then there's going to be, um, you know, something terrible will happen. I'll start doing all kinds of horrible things or, you know, and um, exactly. we may really examine that idea. It's not so, is it? It's not really no, worked no. for us to, to micromanage our experience. <laughs> Can you feel like you can just let go a little bit? Can you just let go of... Oh, I'm really trying to, I really am trying to do that. But I mm -hmm. realise I'm still watching my behaviour. Left, right and centre, and I'm thinking, should I let, can I let go of that even? If you just notice something's, something's on hyper alert, isn't it? Yeah. Something's like, oh, this isn't going to go so well. We better keep an eye on this. Um, well, but if... Like if you just kind of step back from even that, if you can, and just go, well, let's just actually see what happens if I don't try to keep it all together. Um, and you don't have to do it all or nothing, like mine says, you know, it's just try it for 30 minutes, see what happens. Uh, you know, not, not shoulding yourself at all. I should or shouldn't be 
do say have become you know whatever it is we put after those words what's it like when you don't do that to yourself for a short time it does it end in disaster or does it end in something um, much different it's like everything is trying to change anyway isn't it to um, give us what we want anyway but it can't change in that uh, kind of tightness that we have about ourselves well, I do that's what I am trying to do in a way to just leave it leave it leave it mm. but just when you say how dare we live on us how dare we live as we really are and I think it, it's how it means and just let go completely you know just lose nobody controls what happens I am as I am in this moment that's like the simplest way to live isn't it yeah. And um, I was terrified of that at first, but then I realized, you know, everybody else has got their own stuff. Nobody's even going to notice if I'm really um, stop controlling myself, hold, trying to hold myself together. And it wasn't working anyway. It wasn't bringing me happiness and peace. And um, what's it like to just be as I am in this moment? What's that, you know, in my, in my mind and my body, what's that like? How does that feel? And there was a contentment that came, no matter, even if there were still negative emotions, as we were just talking about with Andrew, there's a contentment in that. Yeah, I've got no capacity to say I shouldn't be how I am right now, or I should be different to who I am in this moment. And, and as you practice that a little bit, it starts to happen with other people. I've got no capacity to say that anyone else should be different than they are because they can't be other than they are any more than you can. That's really eventually why I let go, because I realized I, I could keep trying to change myself forever, or I could see that that's already trying to occur. It's always trying to occur, but my tight grip on myself is, is, is stifling that. Maybe the self is always moving towards more peace and love and joy anyway. More yeah, wisdom. It's not there all the time. I don't know if it's all the mm -hmm. time, but it's, I realise sometimes that... Well, oh, better not say that. It, it, yeah. If I say that, you, you, there'll be all sorts. You know, it, it's, it's there. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that's has to be there. I don't know. This mm -hmm. is what I'm asking the question for me. <clears throat> the, the things that we would like to change about ourselves... Um, are often a symptom of this trying to uh, sculpt ourselves constantly. And actually, when we let go of doing that, we tend to experience more of the positive things that we would like to emphasize about ourselves and less of those ones we would call negative. You know, so if I tend to be very direct or blunt with someone, something comes out wrong, that's. Uh, Mind says, well, you know, if you let go and stop controlling, you're going to be like that all the time. But it's it's the other way around, actually. It's my constantly holding myself in this shape that I think I should be. Constant self-rejection. I'm not how I'm supposed to be right now. This is not how I'm supposed to be. How can we experience that the fullness of ourselves and, and the highest actions and thoughts and words when we're constantly in rejection of ourselves i'm not how i'm supposed to be right now is what we're all doing isn't it in some way until we don't yeah. 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 take it a little bit further um yeah the character is always like you say I mean, it's always going to be there the character yeah. but the character is also me the know not I think that's what I'm trying to get to. Really, it's, and there's no there's no doer, only the noumenon. So always just trying to get in the middle and negotiate these things. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's uh, it's just one thought in the middle, really, isn't it? One thought. <laughs> yeah. That's all in the all. middle. Yeah. Whatever, some some yeah. kind of fear, usually, of authenticity or something like that. That's really what I came up against, if I just be myself, who I am is not adequate. Therefore, if I be myself, everyone's going to see I'm in, in, inadequate. 
everyone will see my flaws and all of yeah. that, you know, and um, it'll all go very badly. And I just tried it bit by bit. I tried it for an hour and then I really, really enjoyed it. And things went really well instead of terrible. And suddenly all these words of wisdom started coming out of my mouth. I'm like, where did they come from? You know, it's coming out of the emptiness, isn't it? Whereas if I'm trying to think and control myself and make the right impression, it's just some watered down version of diluted version of what was possible. I'll stay with it a bit longer. Thank you. Good, good. Good to talk to you. Uh, Sharon? Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, when you were talking to Kelly, you know, something like really shifted. And, and, and I was, I, the question that she asked is the question that I was trying to understand. Like, how could there not be, how, how can there not be other people? I see all these faces, you know. But yeah. when you're in that silence, of course there can't be anybody else. I'm sorry, Cliff. I'm, I'm I'm one here. I'll be only. See now, he just proved that I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. My husband just came in the room. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm I'm starting to get it's just me, and he had to go walk in. <laughs> there's there's, uh, there's other bodies. We can see other bodies. We have to be you know, truthful. You know. But can we see other beings? This is the this is yeah. the identification with the body. You know, if I think the body I see is a being then I'll be sure there are all these separate beings everywhere. There's lots of human bodies. Right. You know, we get really down to it. Do we know if there's any other beings, you know? Yeah, it's just that when when you said that, I just felt like, of course, there can't be, there's only one of us here. And that in the silence, you can really see that it's only your voice you're listening to because it's all mm -hmm. silence. So it's kind of like, that resonated, and um, I wanted to ask, you know, mind has an idea of what awakening, complete awakening will look like, and... Um, <laughs> it's and, good at doing that, right? It's, right, yeah. right, right, and, and so... <laughs> if it doesn't look like this, if it doesn't look like my <laughs> idea, then I'm obviously not there yet, you know? <laughs> it could t well, I said that this morning in the Sangha, that it always will say it's not there yet, but... Oh, yeah. But the thing is, like, what I wanted to know from you... Um, was, you know, because every, I think everybody wakes up differently, but for me, it looks like a dream. You know, there's a feeling of dreamy. I don't know what that is, but I've been talking about that for a long time. It's like the awareness has a dream, dreamy feeling to it. It's that, and I've heard you say that in one of your teachings, you know, that it's dreamy like. Yeah, for me, it just always came with this um, softness, this quality this gentle soft lovingness that kind of came with the silence or the awareness whatever we're calling it is and um it, it seems very very different to to how we have seen ourselves in the world that isn't um when we first start to recognize that and eventually it flips on its head that the world we used to think about seems very dreamlike um and the it silence seems does. very, very real. You know, it kind of flips over. Yeah, and, and the, the thing that the mind is saying, you know, because I have an opening that goes all the way down to my face, you know, and the mind, you know, the the root chakra, or let's say the, the ground, you know, um, it's still the I'm not safe program is still running. I can feel it, you know, and I, so I continue to go, on my walks asking, is it true that I'm not safe? Is there something else I can do? Because it's in my feet sometimes, pain, and I just kind of use acupressure shoes and I push it, and open some meridians. But, you know, for you, you had a total awakening. Can you tell us what that was like? Did it go through your butt? Or will, or will our mind just try to get it and then we won't get anywhere, you know? Do you mean about the sort of energetic component of it? Do you yes. Mean the, yeah. um, the energetic component. That, that was a very grad well there was times when it was very strong sudden surges um very noticeable downward energy moving down the body and, and it was very obvious where it hit down, down the chakra system 
where it hit a blockage, you know, some belief. It was very um, obvious where it got stuck, let's just say, because some it would show up in some part of my life or my body or uh, corresponding with wherever it was stuck. But there were times it, it was very, very forceful almost. Um, sometimes I felt like, uh, especially with the root chakra, that was my kind of most blocked one. It felt like something was just literally pulling me down, like somebody had turned the gravity up mm. somehow, like twice the the gravity. Um, but it, it, it worked its way right down through the body and the chakras one by one and down through my legs and feet and um, <clears throat> kind of cleared everything out that was in the way of living this. It was... It was in some ways, a very physical process. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of right now for the unfolding just to happen, right? I just immerse myself in your teachings and, you know, whatever I can immerse myself in, just in that the the uh, the sangha that you gave um, uh, last, I don't know if it was Monday or Thursday, on attention, putting attention. <laughs> they all run into each other, don't they? All the days are just running into each other. <laughs> um the attention, you know, that just leaving it there and just sitting with it for 30 days. You know, when you said that, are you saying that we just walk around and just completely bring our mind back to the present? You know. You, you can, you can <clears throat> practice it in formal meditation as well, but, you you know, it's best also to do it during the day. Uh, while I'm walking, you're know, going for my walk, kind of be aware of the space in which my body and the street I'm walking down is appearing in that the, the attention can be looking at something different than what my eyes are looking at. It doesn't have to be um, our attention zooms in and, and narrows into what our eyes are looking at and we begin to think about that thing then and it, it um, proliferates this sense of separation then. So you can practice it inside and outside of formal meditation and eventually it just becomes a way of being that no matter what my mind is doing, what my senses are doing, uh, my attention is kind of always just open on, on the spaciousness of being on the um, it's just aware of awareness we in the same practice we've always been doing just a different way to describe it really that sometimes is more accessible for some beings well when I have the awareness like where I I it's all everywhere just it, and that's the way it always was isn't it the attention that moved and that's yes. why I see it okay yeah. That's what I figured, because I was trying to, you know, I think like uh, most of us, we really don't know, you know, we want to finish it up already. <laughs> you know, if you if you get a sense, though, that wherever my attention is, if it's looking at an object, a thought, mm -hmm. or if it's kind of turned around to look at the source, the awareness that's everywhere, mm -hmm. the awareness is never changed or whatever attention is doing. If attention is looking at a thought or an emotion or an object, the body mind will feel more contracted and lower in frequency and ne will start to experience negative emotions and things like that. And if attention is turned around to look back at the awareness, the infinite awareness, then the body mind will feel much lighter and freer and expansive. But the awareness is the same either way, isn't it? You know, and, and attention really it. is awareness. Really, there's no difference. Um, it's just awareness has this capacity to either focus on an object or to focus on the subjectiveness of, of the self, the formlessness. That's all we're learning to do is just to, it just wasn't obvious to me before that there was some other way, way to, to be, to put my attention on. Mm -hmm. And just practicing that it eventually just became a habit to always be aware of the um, the background of my experience rather than what's going on in the foreground. You don't you don't lose sight of what's going on in the foreground, but it's it's less you, you can't get involved with it, and you can't suffer from there. It's just uh, what's going on rather than it's happening to me here. Well that was great. Thank you, Helen. Good to talk to you. Uh, Natasha. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, I'm <coughs> doing me. good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I asked this question um, in Sangha today, and um, and I thought, as as you were here, um, I'd like to to ask you about it. It, yeah. um, it was related to um, the, the sense of body and the sense of silence that I have while sitting because um, I've been doing meditation for a few years on and off and I would attend to the breath or attend or, or, or do a mantra or something like that and I've never attended to this this silence this this, this sort of sense of uh, it feels to me like uh, it's really loud, actually. And I'm amazed that I I'd never heard it before. It's like it starts as um it, it sometimes changes, but it's it's like a, a kind of vibrating sound, and it starts to it starts in my ears. And I've never had tinnitus or anything like that. And I don't have it. I only, I only hear this sound, like I'm hearing it kind of now in the background when I'm attending to it. Um, and I can't really hear it if I'm in a very noisy place. Um, maybe yet. Yeah, but the feeling, nice I have in the, body, <laughs> yeah. um, the feeling I have in the body is that I mean, I, I do sort of sit in, a, in a, a fairly formal meditation posture. And then I notice that um, it's like I have to kind of let go. It, it's not, not that I have to, but when I start to tune into the sound, there's, there's a sense of the body letting go and releasing in the jaw and, and wanting to feel this, this real sort of comfort and, and relaxed posture in order for this sound and this vibration to kind of really pervade me more and more mm. and until um and this is only I mean I'm doing the dissolving ego course and this is the first time I, I'm experiencing this in meditation it's it's a real sense of well-being but also of a kind of expansion where where the limits of my body and the space I'm occupying seem to sort of dissolve. It all gets and a bit then, blurry, doesn't it? You know. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And I'm. So my my question is, you know, th this is right, right? <laughs> I'm I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. The yeah. the the silence itself. Um, I know. I totally know what you mean when you say. It, it was astonishing for me how how loud it was in a strange way. How can silence be loud? But it suddenly became very obvious. Uh, well, not suddenly over the, the time I'd been practicing, that it had always been there, and I'd absolutely never noticed it yeah. because my attention was always going to the sound, the the noise, the movement of thought, external noise or internal noise. And that our attention is just habituated to go to what's moving and changing and jumping up and down for our attention. And when the mo very moment you begin to shift and put attention on the, the background of your experience, that silent, still uh, nothingness, silence, we're calling it here, the body immediately begins to reflect that back to you in some way. First of all, just things, muscles begin to relax. And sometimes mind starts to slow down. For me, there is this sense of contentment because it's been um, costing us so much energy to pay attention only to phenomena. It makes us feel separate then because we're focusing only on one uh, body-mind vehicle. My thoughts, my emotions, all of that. When you stop doing that, even for a moment, the body kind of goes, oh, that's nice. You know, there's something pleasant there, isn't there, for, for, for you really? in that. Yeah. And also, I mean, I can feel it now as we speak. But there's, um, I mean, obviously in my hands, that's where, you know, generally I, I feel it most, but also in my body that I, I really feel the, um, the vibration in my body in a way. I, I, I don't think, and I've done lots of yoga and qigong, but I, I don't think I've ever really felt it in this way. Is it, is it, well, yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's just simply that we've been operating on 
a very small amount of life force, like like mm-hmm. trying to run your car on empty, you're not going to get the best experience or performance, are you? It's and suddenly we stop doing that thing that costs us so much energy, which is, you know, me is the infinite self that's everywhere, imagining myself to be just someone somewhere. You can kind of get a sense maybe of just how much energy that costs us or every single moment and where the body begins to wear out and suffer from that eventually. Um, it's very, very taxing. That's why we need sleep, a lot of sleep usually as a separate being. So when we stop doing that, the life force can flow through the body. Um, like someone turns up the intensity of that because we're not wasting all this energy unknowingly paying attention to things. Uh, it's not our natural state to constantly focus on thoughts and things, but we've been doing it for so long, we don't know how much energy that's costing us. And when we stop doing it, it begins to build up in the body just during that meditation at first, but it sort of spills over outside of formal meditation eventually. You just feel lighter, you feel happier, a sense of contentment, mm-hmm. well-being, maybe a sense that everything's all right with the world, you know, all of that. Uh, and, and it just gets louder and louder, that sense. Yeah. I mentioned was- today that I'd, I'd noticed that... Um, and not all the time, but I found people more beautiful. Yeah. There was there was a sense like, I, that, yeah, that they were more beautiful. Obviously, colours, I've had that in meditation anyway. When you suddenly, you walk out in the street and colours are just more vivid and bright. And, um, but in, in but food, for me, there was... The taste, the taste of food mm. and the smell, you know, like, remember the first time I, I smelled fresh coffee brewing afterwards. Oh, that's amazing. Or oh, tasting chocolate or... Every experience is kind of heightened because you, you can you're fully present to the experience rather than being only experiencing what you think about things. And we've never really, um, never really seen each other. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? But we've only really experienced each other through the filter of thoughts. Like, what's this person going to think of me? Are they going to like me? You know, uh, and all of that going on inside and. What does he mean by that? Why did he say that? And when that falls away, even for a moment, it's actually like every everything can look extraordinarily beautiful. I, I just like there's some days there's a blossom, the cherry tree blossom here. You know, it's just it's just starting to go now. But there's some places I just can't drive. There's, there's a centre town here, and it's got um, a, a green uh, like a park, and it's just surrounded by these pink cherry blossom trees and I just have to avoid it if I have to be somewhere or if I have to sit there and cry for a while because it's just stunningly beautiful yeah. and, and it, it's, it's really all of life can look like that we can experience it like that we've been so lost in our own heads in a way haven't we absolutely it's good that you're experiencing uh, this um breaking through in a way and, and your body can absolutely handle that energy as it begins to build it will know exactly what to do it might right. yawn or laugh or cry or stretch or you might find yourself dancing around the kitchen or something yeah. you know to kind of it knows exactly what to do with it if you can yeah. trust it through that process yeah yesterday i felt a bit trippy i must say i felt a bit trippy and, and there was that kind of there was that laughter that comes when you've taken some kind of hallucinogen that, that you start to feel a bit like, what's going on? And then, yeah, and then I just took time to, to come out of it. But, yeah. It's, um, I remember one time somebody asked me, it wasn't long after I started, really started to deepen into the silence, somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? And uh, I thought it was the most hilarious thing. I just couldn't stop laughing because it, it, it was suddenly this sense that I, I could do something seemed really, really bizarre. Got, you, know, you come out the other side of that, but you might have this initial period where there's your body's getting used to the, the um, excess of energy. We've never really had an excess, have we? Kind of drag ourselves out of bed in the morning and yeah. somehow make it through the whole day and go to bed exhausted. You know, it's... It's different when you 
do you remember when you were three or four years old and you used to leap out of bed and you were so yeah. excited about the day and you had no idea what was going to happen and you really didn't want to go to bed at night because you didn't want to miss out yeah <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you good to talk to you thank you okay Anyone else like to ask? We've got time for one more or two more. <clears throat> Feel free to shout if you want to uh, make a comment or share something. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Good, good. So one of the things that um, I guess is this idea that um, just to simplify, like there's two ways to come at it. One is to sort of try to look in the openness and let that unravel the conditioning and the tightening patterns. And the other is focusing on my tightening patterns and let that lead me to the openness. Yeah. And that's and doing it because I was doing it on my own seemed easier. And um, I can see like how there's this, how, like this resistance, like somehow even when things are open, there's some level, some layer of consciousness which d is denying and mm -hmm. refusing and just being stubborn. It's like a little kid just having a little I'm not. I'm not doing this, yeah. I'm just not doing <laughs> it, yeah. And I can be oblivious to it. Like I could be having a tantrum and not ex experience it consciously because mm -hmm. I did it as a little kid and I just stored it up in my system. And so I feel like that's been um, a lot of these sort of young, um, young kid tantrums have been releasing lately. And, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's the same for me. There's an awful lot of anger had to come out, some kind of, I don't know where it came from, but... It just had to come out, you know, as we were saying before. And then it's okay, isn't it? It'll come to the surface. Yeah. It's just weird because I'm not doing it um, in this uh, meditative states or anything. I'm doing it in a really just, um, I'm just seeing it and allowing it to be what it is. So, there, I mean, there is, you know, some state to that. But Yeah. And I'm actually, I'm seeing how negativity was formed like I, I am having that experience of of seeing how the judgments are accumulate and how they come together and how they just create um these patterns of negativity of resistance and i remember having this tantrum when i was 13 or something probably at age where i was sitting in my room and, and i used to do yoga i didn't know i was doing yoga but i was i started doing advanced yoga but it was all intuitive and uh, I was in this, and I had this tan, I was just mad. And I was just like, I don't want any help <laughs> because I was mad that I wasn't getting help. And I was frustrated, you know, like with inner guidance. And um, <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> I forgot why I brought it up now. <laughs> I had a point, I lost it. <laughs> but um, I, I think I, I remember another part of that was I want to understand how it's going. I don't want you to just, I don't want it to just happen. I want to understand it. So I have a feeling that that might be also why things have unfolded the way they did. Like on some level, maybe it was harder than it had to be. But on the other level, on another way of looking at it is because of that, that I was able to see details. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering um, if, um, like I probably would have seen details anyway <laughs> if I had, had lightened that, you know, just, just gently requesting it. I probably uh, doing it the tough way wasn't necessarily necessary, but it was. Unless it was, yeah. <laughs> so it we was. have to do it that way, right? We have to uh, yeah. um, battle through heroically. Yeah. Well, it was my own stubbornness that required it, right? It was my own like resistance that required me to do it the hard way, but I wanted to do it no matter what. Because there's nothing else to do. And I think sometimes unworthiness plays that way. It did for me. Um, un unless I've gone through some, uh, you know, really, really challenging uh, task, you know, come right through the other side and fought my way through this big sacrifice. 
I won't feel worthy of awakening. You know, I've got to do it the hard way. I can't just effortlessly and easily slide into silence and peace. You know, there's got to be some struggle to prove my worthiness or something to go, I did it, yay, you know, something like that at the end. Sometimes there's some unworthiness behind it as well. Yeah, I think that the, like these archetypes are standard no matter what we're pursuing. So, because mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was on a spiritual path, like as far as I knew, I just knew that um, I had a message that the suffering could end. And so I was following that message. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I faced down a lot of these things without having the the spiritual ideas that I have to earn. It, it was more like this idea of having to rise to the occasion to achieve. I, I realized some of it actually was really useful because it makes me stand up until I find what the balance point is. So the balance is I need this much effort to yeah. face resistance, but I don't have to fight it. I just I don't need, have to charge and stampede it down here. Yeah. yeah. Simply just need the insistence and the determination, which has this much amount of energy. And that's really what it meant. But in the ignorance, I assume that I just have to be tough or I have to this or that. So, yeah, I, I guess it's like, I think all the challenges have an aspect to them that is valid, but we don't understand the goodness of it. So we interpret it the wrong way and and that's just standard it's just what we're going to do yeah there, there was never a time where i went through a challenge where i thought well i was so where the only feeling was so glad that that happened there was always you know well that taught me something usually in hindsight you know wouldn't be where i am now without all the challenges and um it was only later um that i could stop uh resisting them because they're the only way we're going to grow really aren't they to to uh, push through things when, when we have to push through things that's the only time we do usually for some strange reason as human beings you know we don't just sit here and grow in bliss it just doesn't seem to work that way yeah some balance of this um hard and soft yeah yeah so in that i'm oh, sorry i was gonna say there is this sense of of needing to use that energy of, of hardness because that's the determination, but I'm using it correctly, then it's going to work. And if I don't use it correctly, then I'm going to suffer. Is that? Yeah. It's, um, it's like a kind of yang energy, isn't it? Like a, a sort of pushing, um, I can either sit with this resistance and keep holding myself back or I can kind of charge through it. And some things, I the only way through it was to was to really just go right through it. You know, some sort of sense of uh, the only way through this is to just put my head down and go right through it. Some fear or um, some belief that I was really believing, but knowing when to then let that go. You know, that I don't have to go through my entire existence like that, like I was doing, trying to I don't know fight my way through everything. It is a balance, isn't it, between some things will just dissolve in your openness, as we were saying earlier. Some things you might have to be more proactive with like that. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah thank you. Yeah, because it gets sometimes confusing when we focus so much on the letting go. Mm -hmm. Since in my experience, a lot of my letting go has come with buckling down to allow, but it, it was done in the right way, I guess. It really is always a balance between focusing on what we really are and then at some point will be a call to look at what we're not, some belief will come up to look at. So it's always going to be a little bit of both um, and gradually more and more just noticing what you really are being that and then every now and again have to exert some effort to, to push through some belief that's popped up or some emotion that comes you kind of get the hang of that when to really when you really need to look at something and examine it or when you can just let it go yeah i can see that that's been improving and improving and improving yeah thank you so much you're very very welcome lovely good to talk to you okay uh, it's probably a good place to uh leave it for now 
Um, it's uh, been wonderful to spend time uh, just talking through things like this. So I want to say a deep, deep thank you for your presence and um, for being here in this group with us all. Thank you.